So, are we live? It does say we are live, yes. Okay, excellent. Let's get going. Hello, everybody. Just give it a few minutes for the little counter here to start showing people turning up. Yes, we have our first viewer. Hello, everybody. Hope you're well. Uh, thank you for being here, and especially if you're in England. It's fantastic weather outside, and I really want to thank you for uh, taking time to be here listening to us rather than being out there in fantastic weather. So thank you very much for being here. Um, today's topic is, uh, as the description says, uh, Bitcoin basic, so it will be a very basic uh, description. But there are a few issues that our members, existing members, have been raising over a period of time in the discussions that they have with other people. And we want to try and address those things and just get to understand Bitcoin a little better from a very simplistic point of view so that you can explain it to a 10-year-old. Um, and it does not have to be as complicated and technical. Now, I have my able colleague, Bill Wilmot, with me here. He will engage with you in the chat uh, because I won't be able to present in chat at the same time. Um, if you have any questions or anything, please shoot there. But um, we may not actually get enough time for question and answers. We'll try and see how it goes. We'll just you know, go with the flow, right? So let's get straight into the, uh, today's presentation. I'm just going to share my screen. Bear with me. Uh, uh, screen share. Bill, if you, don't mind, uh, if you don't mind, please, if you can confirm if you see what I'm saying. It should say Bitcoin basics explained in a basic way. Can you see that, Bill, if you're not muted? All good, Mike. All good. All right. Awesome. Let's get going. Bitcoin basics explained in a basic way. First of all, let us all just clear the deck a little bit and ask a very simple question. Are you here because you want to make get Bitcoin to make you wealthy? Is that the, is that the whole point? Is, uh, are you here because Bitcoin is of monetary in, interest to you? Or are you here because you care about how the blockchain technology really works and what distributed ledgers are all about and the algorithm and the inner workings and the cogs and the wheels and statistical analysis and all the jargon attached to Bitcoin. If you are here for the latter, we can cover all of these over a period of time because there's a lot of content. But if you're here just because Bitcoin is catching your attention because it is money, then Everything we discuss in this video today, you should be able to share it freely. There are no links. There is no other further description. It's just a video on its own. Share it if you want to point to somebody the discussion we are about to have. Now, <coughs> excuse me. From the general public, this is what happens. Bitcoin is a bubble. It's a, a challenge, an allegation. It is uh, an opinion. It is a theory, or is it fact? So let's explore this. This is going to be an open-ended question. I'm not going to give you the answers, but you will be the ones to determine what is your answer for this. Because it's one thing for me or anybody else or any other person to give an opinion, but what do you personally make of it? Let's, let's deal with that first, because when you know what it is, you can answer people in your own words, and you don't have to borrow somebody else's words, OK? So this is what Bitcoin should look like. This is just a visual example. So uh, you know, it's not necessarily uh, the way Bitcoin really works, but this is the theory behind it. So let me show you something here. If one Bitcoin is $1, you could represent it like this, 0.7 zeros to the right of the decimal followed by one. You could represent Bitcoin like that, OK? Now, it did go from $1 to $10 at some point in its lifespan. That is a 10 times jump. 10x on the side here tells you it's a 10 times jump. The proportion of the jump it made in price is exactly the same from 10 to 100. So now that is also 10 times. and then from a hundred to a thousand. That is also ten times. Was it a bubble between one and ten? 
Some would have thought so. Was it a bubble between 10 and 100? Some would have thought so. Today, the price hovered around 2,600 the last time I checked. So I just quickly updated the chart because I wasn't sure what, what price it might be today. So 5th of July, Bitcoin is in the region of $2,600. Unless something happened in the last few minutes, I don't know. And that is somewhere in the region between 1,000 and 10,000. Yeah, it's closer to 1,000 clearly, but it's somewhere in that region. Now, if people say this is a bubble, you need to ask them, well, was it not a bubble just a little before that when it jumped 10 times in value and then 10 times before that and then 10 times before that? And if you just look at the digits in here, look at these ones coming down in a diagonal line here. If Bitcoin reached $100 million each, if, I'm not saying it's going to, but if, mathematically, this unit, this currency, Bitcoin, has that ability, mathematically. And it has that ability better than any other fiat currency, including the dollar, because those billions and trillions are printed and created out of nothing. Bitcoin doesn't work like that. Bitcoin has something real behind it, which is proof of work. So when people say it's a bubble, you need to first qualify the statement, bubble compared to what? Okay, a bubble is a bubble is a bubble. Agreed. We understand the word. And a bubble, the idea behind it is that it pops. Okay, so fine. If it pops, it'll go back down 10, 10 times to hundreds of levels, uh, levels of just 100 or so. But we are here at this stage, and there are that many more levels to climb. So now, who is a person or anybody to say that it's a bubble at this stage when it has already overcome a number of stages already in the same progression? This is just a mathematical visualization for you to understand. If it is a bubble, please qualify your statement. Because it took time to get to this point, and it took a lot of other factors to get to this point. But without considering those factors, if somebody says, oh, it's just a bubble, those are the kind of people who say everything is just a scam. Well, if everything is just a scam, you know what? I'm sorry, but there is not going to be a discussion with somebody that insists on being obstinate about it. But those who are slightly more open-minded will begin to see the point in this particular uh, graphical uh, representation, this numerical representation, that you know, there is a lot more going for it um, than just for this bubble to burst at this point. Now, should you buy and hold? This is a big, big discussion because a lot of people say, well, just buy and hold. Why do you bother mining Bitcoin? Why do you bother doing anything else with Bitcoin? Just buy it and hold it. Fine. Well done. <clears throat> they have their reasons. We have our reasons, not just to buy and hold. Of course, we want to hold, but we don't necessarily want to buy. We want to mine it. We want to earn it. We want to have it as a reward. We want to be given it to us because of a uh, proper Bitcoin related activity rather than spend money on it and then just sit on it, right? There are two different approaches here. So let's have a look at what this means. The top chart, as you can see, is literally from Google search trend. You can find this yourself at google.com. Uncle Google is faithful and will give you this particular graph. Then you can go to another website called Bitcoin Price at 99bitcoins.com, and it will tell you Bitcoin price history. If you compare the two charts, literally, month by month, okay? Now, this Google Trend chart starts in 2012, and this one here starts in January 13. That's why these lines are diagonal. But this initial peak in the price of Bitcoin, the very first peak when it even came on public radar in a meaningful way, coincided over here with that many more people performing an actual search on Google. So this is your evidence and this is your proof in knowing that when more people start researching it and considering buying it, its price moves up. When those people stop researching it, the trend follows and goes down. 
Then there's only a few people remaining here in the middle at the bottom that continue to access Google for Bitcoin purposes or Bitcoin-related search engine and, uh, and websites. Then it went up again, and you can see that graph here. It went up again. So this literally means the, there is a direct and very close correlation, and you can see literally there's a peak here, there's a peak here. Then that peak comes down. Here again, the peak comes down. Then there's another little mountain here. There's another little mountain here. Then it comes down and stays flat for a very long time. It comes down here and stays relatively flat for a very long time. There are a few bumps and lumps on the way. And closer to the end of uh, sort of December 2016, January 17, that's when this major spike begins. That's exactly the same chart over here, major spike begins. This represents the total number of extra people than before that are doing a Bitcoin-related Google search, which is then reflected in the price. So what does that mean? They're not just doing a Bitcoin-related search. They're actually searching for Bitcoin in order to buy Bitcoin. So this is literally public exposure reflected in the price. You cannot get more uh, purist than this. This is the purest way of looking at it to say that Bitcoin price is directly related to the interest in the general public. This, first of all, shoots down all those people who say, oh, it's just a small group of people that are controlling it and manipulating it. It's a scam. And there are some secret organizations that are doing this, that. And look, secret organizations can't get the broad public to do a Bitcoin search on Google Trend. Uh, trends that you can visibly capture and then match it with the price. This literally means new people coming in. Imagine a whole, you know, half of you, you open your window, uh, a hotel window in Mumbai, India, and just open your hotel window one morning and you'll have five million people outside. Okay, this is, this is how populated some of the parts of the world are. Now, when the trend catches on, the price reflects accordingly. When there is greater acceptance, even from the government level, and when the government start deciding, okay, you know what, we're going to let this happen, but we'll try and put some type of control around it because we are concerned about money laundering and stuff like that. At that point, obviously, you know, Bitcoin gets a little more comfort that, okay, we can actually, the common Joe public can actually get into it, um, but knowing in the back of their minds that, you know, somebody's watching, it's not going to completely vanish. There are just too many millions of people involved in Bitcoin for it to disappear, as somebody say. So in this case, why am I talking about this in case of buy and hold? Well, allow me to explain. It's very, very simple. Buy and hold people say it's all about the volatility. But before we get into that, if I just uh, break from here for a moment and uh, get back to my screen, I'll tell you a little story about my dry cleaner. Um, my dry cleaner just down the road, he, um, he doesn't accept visa cards. <clears throat> so I said, hey, I have a suggestion for you. You take cash. It's a pain for me to go find an ATM machine and then bring the cash for you. So why don't you take Bitcoin? He said, oh, I don't know anything about that. Talk to my son. He knows all that. So I went there for a second time, found his son, and I said, hey, I had a suggestion for your dad. Why don't you accept Bitcoin instead? It's relatively cheaper. You don't have to pay merchant fees to Visa, MasterCard, and all the others. Why don't you accept Bitcoin? And he says, whoa, don't even mention Bitcoin to me. I'm like, why? He's like, it's all related to crime. I'm like, how do you know that? He says, I worked in, in one of the crime investigations, and, and they caught a guy and froze his bank account, and everything was gone for a year, and everything was frozen up for him, and he was involved in this crime. and you know, the police, if they find out that you've got Bitcoin, they're going to shut you down. You know? And I'm thinking, are you living in, in the same England that I live? Or is this some kind of a draconian fascist regime where you can't even do things without government permission? Are you in sort of Nazi Germany or something? You know, he says, no, you don't know. You know, they keep an eye on everything. I mean, look at the level of paranoia. 
And the reason I wanted to uh, mention this story is that he heard about Bitcoin through one criminal investigation. Now, when you get to this point where every uh, uh, clerk in a department somewhere, you know, fancies himself to be the head of MI5, you know, you have an issue there because they are clearly misinformed. There are millions of people, there are tens of thousands of people right here in the UK on their way to becoming Bitcoin millionaires, and you think they will get shut down. Why? Because the UK government is somehow evil, or there's some conspiracy happening. You have to really pick the people. I was trying to help him. The person was not ready to even think that a digital currency can exist because you can't do anything without government permission. So I just thought I'll throw that story in there before I carry on with buy to hold because I think it's an important discussion to know that no matter what happens, you will come across people who are petrified of just living <laughs> in a democracy, <laughs> in, in a relatively free nation where you don't have to bribe police officers for speeding fines. You know, you get you have to pay a speeding fine. You can't bribe them in cash. You know, so the, the, we live in a re relatively comfortable environment. Why the paranoia? I just don't understand. But there are people like that. And you can't educate everybody, but you can do your best. Anyway, I'm going to continue sharing and on with the, um, uh, bear with me. There we go. <clears throat> it should be sharing now. So on with what about this volatility? Why did we look at those two charts, the trend chart and the matching price chart? What's, what's the big deal there? <coughs> Excuse me. So let's have a look. The one of the peaks you saw, and I'm using the trend chart here to reflect the price chart because the trend chart is a little less cluttered. If you actually, if I just go back, if you go to 99bitcoins.com, you will see there are these little numbers all over the place. And these numbers will tell you the historical events that have taken place, which are significant in the life cycle of Bitcoin price so far. So it will give you a good idea in assessing what happened, when it happened, and you'll get a little familiar. It's, it's a, a lot more interesting than reading history. This is the history of Bitcoin, but you have a monetary interest in this. You know, learning history on its own doesn't actually pay you any money, so people find it boring sometimes. But you know, this is what happened. Around March 13, 2013, Bitcoin peaked at around $200. Then came and that was in, in, uh, uh, just after the Cyprus bail-in. So you can imagine the bail-in scenario panicking a whole lot of people who are awake and aware of what the banks are really like and what they're up to and what they could be doing now here in the remaining G20 nations. So that is what forced Bitcoin to peak up. So when banks are in trouble, expect good things for Bitcoin. But then, you know, the Cyprus bail-in issue was kind of brushed under the carpet. It didn't go mainstream. So many people don't even know about it. So that's when there was a price crash because the, peer, the fear and the panic of a sustained banking issue was not strong enough to sustain interest in Bitcoin. So it crashed. It's very normal. And you can check this out in around the region of March 2013 how Bitcoin price correlated to the Cyprus bailout. Then when it crashed, it stayed fairly flat around 60, 65 level. It was hovering around there. And then something happened. The Bank of China, BOC, said OK to Bitcoin per se. It didn't like uh, Chinese financial institutions to deal with Bitcoin, but it said it's OK for exchanges to pop up and the public to buy and hold Bitcoin as an alternative because the Chinese yuan renminbi is a restricted currency and the Chinese are suddenly cash rich because of this massive manufacturing program they have. So they have a lot more liquidity. They're all driving Volkswagens all of a sudden when 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they were all riding bicycles uh, and that too imported from India. So, you know, if you, if you think it through, uh, uh, good news, like the Bank of China saying OK, had an immediate price impact. It shot up to over $1,000 around December 2013, and that was the all-time high at that point. And then something interesting happened. 
Um, uh, I won't mention the other peak because that'll be a very long discussion overall. But eventually, when it came back down, you know, around exactly around uh, 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 two years ago, Bitcoin actually hovered around two hundred and sixty-four dollars. I mean, are you thinking you should have picked up some then? Maybe were you aware of it? And this is why I asked you the question in the first place: Are you in Bitcoin because it's got the potential to make you wealthy? Or are you in it because of the algorithm? Because if you're in it for the algorithm, then you've already have bought a lot of Bitcoin way, way back, really early, when it was as cheap as this. But if you're joining the bandwagon now, we are amongst the relatively later adopters of Bitcoin. And then obviously the price went all the way, you know, flatlined till here. And then around March 2017, towards the end of uh, 2016, it shot up again, and we saw the Three thousand dollar peak just a few months ago. Okay, now why am I showing you this? When it comes to volatility, this is volatility. Good news, it goes up. Fear about something else, this becomes a safety safe haven. Cyprus bail-in is bad news for them, so it's good news for Bitcoin. Bank of China saying "Well done, Bitcoin" is good news for Bitcoin. It's good news for us. When nothing else is happening and it's just flatlining, and the general it, and, and the whole Bitcoin community is unable to uh, get massive worldwide acceptance for it, <clears throat> it is flatlining for a very very long time. But now something has changed. Now it has come up to the three thousand barrier, uh, three thousand sort of level, and then it's hovering between two and two, uh, no, two and a half thousand to three thousand, and this is a sort of new. Uh, flatlining level it has found. It may not flatline this long, but it is hovering within a reasonable range, which is way, way higher than when it was around $65 just three years ago. Compare this to the US inflation figures. You can find this at usinflationcalculator.com. You'll be amazed if you put in figures here like 1913 to 2017 you'll get something like 2,400% inflation or something. But let's just go with 2013, because the previous chart we discussed, uh, to be precise, this chart was in the region of January onwards in 2013. So I've gone here for 2013. I'm not going too far back. I'm just trying to keep it relevant to Bitcoin. <clears throat> now, 2013 to 2017, if you had $100, then in 2017, you're going to need $105 to buy the same item that would have cost you $100 just four years ago. That is 5% inflation. That 5% inflation means a guaranteed loss, a guaranteed loss in your purchasing power of your dollar. What does that mean for Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is volatile. You know, this thing is a straight line going down. It is not going up. This inflation, uh, and a lot of the inflation figures are very nicely cooked, but the reality is when you go to the petrol station, the gas station, when you go to buy your daily groceries, and if you go to book the same holiday, the same vacation package that you booked five years ago, exactly the same thing, you will notice way more than 5% inflation in there. And that's not just because of increased demand from other people. It is also because everybody's raising their prices. Same thing if you go to, for example, 20 years ago, if you went to the Czech Republic, uh, people used to say how absolutely everything is dirt cheap. It's amazing. You can pay in Czech kronas, which is, you know, nothing. And now you go there and all your prices in Prague and other cities of uh, Czech Republic are basically the same price as euro. And they don't even use euros. But they've got so many euro customers coming in, uh, euro travelers and visitors coming in, that the price is exactly the same. So what does that inflation mean to the local Czech person? It's much higher than just 5% per year, right? But we don't get to see it unless you're careful in measuring how you measure it. So <clears throat> which is better, a volatile a ship caught in a storm or a ship guaranteed to sink? And this is what's happening with the dollar. This is a 100-year chart going from 1913 to about 2013 when our Bitcoin our Bitcoin story starts. Bitcoin is a little older than that, but uh, our story starts 2013 onwards, looking at the charts. 
This Bitcoin story, here, uh, this dollar story here is 100 years prior to that, and you have almost a guaranteed slide in the purchasing power of the dollar. And if you paid attention to what a $100 million Bitcoin should look like, if you looked at that graphic just a few minutes ago, you will begin to realize that that is one thing that is proportionately on the way up. The dollar is a sinking ship. It's better to be caught in a volatile ship than to be in a sinking ship. And this is why. Um, you know, it's fancily mentioned here, USD asset value purchasing power in the red line. What it really means is extra cash floating around in the economy, which is diluting its purchasing power. The more of money they print and float around in the economy, the less it is worth in its ability to buy the same thing. So the chart you looked at earlier, the 100-year the, the chart for the dollar, is the actual purchasing power of the dollar. That is on a decline. And on the other hand, the availability of dollar in the market is on its way up. Now, this is a chart that should be of interest to absolutely every single person that earns dollars, whether you do it through network marketing or whether you do it through a job or whether you have a regular business. You must understand what this chart is doing to you because you think you may be earning more dollars, but you're earning more and more of worthless paper, which is why we have this business model of gold, silver, and cryptocurrency, which is a solution. And I hope these charts are a good, uh, give you some clarity on why Bitcoin is actually a hedge, a protection against inflation, as much as it is an opportunity to uh, 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 transform your wealth using just a little bit of Bitcoin. You don't have to put all your eggs in one basket. Five to 10% of your total wealth in gold and silver would be ideal. And then on top of that, whatever you deem suitable in taking a risk with Bitcoin, that should be ideal. <coughs> so should you buy and hold or mine Bitcoin? We haven't yet fully addressed that issue, have we? But I just want to tell you another little story, and that's the hairdresser. Now, who is this hairdresser? Let me show you. This haircut was given to me by my hairdresser and uh, today. And uh, I just quickly added that into uh, the presentation today. And I thought, uh, you know, I was talking to her and um, I said, have you heard of Bitcoin? She's like, what do you do? You know, as you know, you do the small talk, don't you? Like, you know, have you been on holiday? That kind of thing. So uh, I said, no, not yet. Uh, I'm, I'm too busy developing my business. I'm, I'm at home. Uh, I really need a break. We're going soon uh, on a short break. But, uh, you know, we started talking. I told her about Bitcoin. She looked, so what is that then? I said, well, let's put it this way, right? If you put 400 pounds in the bank 18 months ago, how much would you have today? She like 400, maybe a little bit of interest. I said, okay. If you'd put 400 in Bitcoin 18 months ago, how much do you think you'd have today? She's like, I don't know, 500? I said, no, over 2,000. She's like, what? How, how do you do that? I took out my mobile phone. I opened my Coinbase, and I showed her Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin. She's like, oh, so what? how does this work? I said, do one thing. Come on this Hangout if possible. If not, I have a whole YouTube channel. There's a whole bunch in there. For your own interest, for your own interest, just open a free wallet with, for Bitcoin with Coinbase. I suggest Coinbase for now. You can switch later on anyway. And see what 50 pound or $50 will do for you over a few weeks. You'll easily misspend those same $50 somewhere else anyway. And she agreed. She has children also. So she's like, oh, there's so many things, toys that they don't even play with anymore. You know? Yeah, so exactly, right? You're, you're spending on plastic that ends up, you know, in, in a skip uh, eventually. Try this. Surely this might be worth saving a little for your children in case they, when they hit their 18s and their you know, university levels or whatever, they might have something that could have transformed their lives down the line. But because of your foresight, you took the action to do it. 
She's like, I've never heard of this before. How come? And that's the point I want to make towards the end of this presentation. Why is the public unaware of this? Why, are, why is there such a slow mass adoption to it? And we'll get to that in a, in a brief moment. But I'll just get back. My hairdresser now probably already has a Coinbase uh, wallet account. She was so interested in it. I don't think uh, it was right for me to tell her about the mining just yet. But I told her I I'm involved at the very creation of Bitcoin. And when that is created, I get a little reward. And I, I have a whole team. And everybody, some of my team members are making a lot more than I am making. Because the more you put into the production facility, the greater is your little share that you get. And that share that you get can exceed an average UK salary. <gasps> She's like, are you serious? I'm like, yes, but you have to invest. right? So if you're willing to do that, that's great. If not, don't worry. Just start with opening a wallet for your own sake and see what happens. This is just an ordinary conversation. And I did not want to sell her any business model. I did not want to make her an affiliate. I did not want her to, to open a free account or anything. Just open your mind to Bitcoin. She is down the road, like three or four doors down from the same dry cleaner. Anti-Bitcoin, and this person who had never heard of it and suddenly opens up their mind. Amazing. So back to my little presentation, if, uh, if that's OK. So. This is what happened with Bitcoin just recently. And this is why those who say buy and hold have a small point, And those who say you should mine will face with some opposition saying, no, you shouldn't mine. And this is where the discussion should be. And this is why this may be a good video to share with them. Bitcoin mining was incredibly profitable between 2013 and 2014, and some people were doing it very successfully. <coughs> Excuse me. At that point, the Bitcoin miners, um, many of them, set up these little machines at home that were the ASIC processors, and they were mining Bitcoin at home, and everything was going well. Some others went and bought cloud contracts, cloud mining contracts through companies like Genesis directly. But then, as you saw from that earlier chart I showed you, there was a period of time when Bitcoin actually flatlined completely all this time. But at the same time, the number of people joining the mining pool went on increasing. So more rewards were being, being paid out for new miners joining. So that meant the difficulty, also known as the network hash rate, the number of calculations taking place to find the next Bitcoin block was basically going up and up and up, more or less in a straight line. You will notice that the hash rate actually drops every now and then. So it's not a straight line. It is also quite variable. But the general trend is going up. And this is the argument of buy to hold uh, or buy and hold investors uh, against the miners. And it is a fact that around 2015, 2016 period, uh, uh, at towards the end of 2015, at the beginning of 2016, Bitcoin mining was actually unprofitable. So those who purchased cloud mining contracts way back here <coughs> found their contracts to be running out of power here, and their contracts were eventually canceled. Now, we have to bear things in mind here. There were a lot of private miners. And when they became unprofitable and booked a loss, they just tried to flog their equipment on eBay and other such sites and recover whatever money they could recover. And they had their Bitcoin. But they didn't necessarily keep their Bitcoin. And I want to get to that point also. So in the end, it was a loss-making proposition for a whole lot of people. And they didn't tell anybody. They're probably too embarrassed to tell anybody that I tried it, but it didn't work for me, maybe amongst friends, but not necessarily all over social media. But those who purchased contracts from a company like Genesis Mining found a perfect opportunity to slag Genesis Mining off in the public domain, because this is a major company. You can write a review on them. You can go to a blog and talk about them. You can say whatever you want. And then the reader has to actually go and verify, is it true or not? Okay. 
But look, something happened towards the middle of 2016. Bitcoin price started moving up. And it didn't just move up, it actually outpaced significantly the price of Bitcoin. When Bitcoin reached $3,000, um, the algorithm or the, the difficulty rate was sufficiently low to get a mining return of annually 140%. That is phenomenal returns, 140%. You would have recovered your mining contract value paid out to you in Bitcoins in under one year easily, in, in about three quarters of a year, okay? So it was amazing to see how quickly the price can actually outstrip the difficulty rate itself. And this is why if you are a believer that Bitcoin price should constantly climb, you will automatically be a miner. If you are a believer that Bitcoin price will crash, then you must be thinking like a buy and hold type of person. Why? Because what does buy and hold mean? Buy at any price? Or does it mean buy at the dips? So if buy at the dips, they're expecting a dip, obviously. Right? So this is what happens. This is what I wanted to show you why even the miners actually uh, sold out. Um, in the period of time here, um, this chart above here is from January 13th through to December 13th, so two years covered in here. Around August, when Bitcoin started taking off, really, in August 2013, uh, this is now two years ago, it went up 900%. How amazing is that? That means a whole bunch of people got in there really quick because they're like, whoa, this is changing our lives. Let's get on the bandwagon. But there still wasn't enough social media exposure. There still weren't enough people aware of it because the mass media was most certainly not promoting Bitcoin except for a few ad hoc articles here and there and a few bit of CNN coverage. In fact, the other media like uh, Russia Today and uh, 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 the Eastern uh, media, including Al Jazeera, for example, those guys were reporting a lot more on it than your average CNN, Bloomberg TV, and you know, uh, BBC, etc. But they were also having to report because it is a phenomenon to be reckoned with. Now look what happened here. I just want to identify one little, uh, uh, oops, one little uh, uh, period of time here. This is uh, in around uh, uh, the December 13 Bank of China ban on financial institutions holding Bitcoin. They didn't ban Bitcoin. They were okay with Bitcoin. So when Bitcoin peaked around here, there was a lot of people that went in. Great. Here you're looking at paying around $1,200 per Bitcoin. Yeah. When you paid $1,200 per Bitcoin, just a few weeks later, it took a 50% nosedive in a single day. Right. So your $1,200 is now looking like $600. Now, when your $1,200 within days is looking like $600, what are you thinking? That it could go down to zero. Now, would you want to save the remaining 600 or not? Or are you happy for it to go down to zero? That will really test how you approach Bitcoin and what you think of it. Because if you're thinking that this could go down all the way to zero, I might as well get my 600 out. It's OK that I've lost 600, shame. But I want to save the remaining 600. I can't afford to lose this money. That means you are a panic seller. Guess what happens? When you panic sold, if you're in that category, somebody snapped it up and it went right back up. That is demand and supply, ladies and gentlemen. Very simply explained, demand and supply. You're looking at 900% gain on the one side, which attracted everybody's attention, including those who didn't have enough money to lose. They got in, and when it crashed, they lost, and then they panic sold, and many probably didn't even return again. So this is what happens. If you're going to wait for a dip, do you really know what a dip is? Do you really, really know when to identify the right dip 
in which to buy. Surely, now that we are in such fantastic profitable territory for Bitcoin mining, why not just do the mining instead? This is the argument on behalf of the miners, on behalf of the buy and hold. Well, well done, but if you've exhausted all your gunpowder up here, you've got none left to buy at the dip, have you? In fact, you'll be selling to save what little bit you put in there in the first place. That is a trading mindset, not a saving mindset. <coughs> Excuse me. So just to recap, buy and hold. Those who talk about it, they're not looking for an income. They're looking to buy something and wait for it to go up in price. They are interested in the capital gains aspect, not in the daily income aspect. So they're clearly not income seekers. Why argue with people who are looking for something totally different than you? You both may be involved in Bitcoin, but why would you debate with somebody who's not in the same boat for the same reason as you? We're both in the same boat, but not for the same reason. You may want to just cross over to the other side. They're just there for the ride. So it depends how you look at it, right? They are definitely not savers and accumulators because an accumulator would want to have more and more and more, which is what the daily fractional payment of Bitcoin rewards represents. Every day you get little by little by little, you're constantly accumulating and reinvesting, accumulating and reinvesting if you're compounding, even if you're just not compounding, you're just daily simply collecting the fractions and you're happy. Buy and hold can't be an accumulator because they spend all their money on just buying and then they sit on it. They're not accumulating. Then you have to wait. You don't know when the next dip is going to come. Or even if it comes, you may have missed it. You don't necessarily know what level to get in at because it's all open territory. It's all so new that nobody really knows at what level next Bitcoin is going to stabilize. We don't know. We don't know how high it will go and then crash again and then stabilize a little bit and then go higher and then crash again and stabilize a little bit. We don't know. So how can you be an accumulator when you're really not interested in gathering more and more Bitcoin? Instead, you're just exhausting all your resources on buying and holding. And then it's, theoretically speaking, gathering dust. Okay. Uh, they're not necessarily Bitcoin experts either. Just because somebody's learned a few trades here and there does not make anybody a Bitcoin expert. In fact, those who are Bitcoin experts aren't really fully Bitcoin experts, except that they were early and took interest and made an academic study of it, got a good understanding of it, and became experts. So if you want to become a Bitcoin expert, the field is open. The, you know, the world is not limited to just a handful of people that talk about Bitcoin. I am learning as I go along. So will you. It's very straightforward. But that doesn't mean you need to listen to buy and hold type of investors because they are not necessarily the expert to listen to in the first place. Now, these people may have been burnt in mining. With the example shown, there was a period of time when Bitcoin mining contracts were unprofitable and people took their frustration out on various websites. That is no longer the case. We have proof through hundreds and hundreds of members who are profitably mining since November last year, and many have more than recovered the original seed capital already. Okay? Buy and hold people are not confident in price growth. I'll explain that in a moment. And they're not necessarily suitable for debating. Why would, like I said, you know, why would you debate a person who's got a totally different mindset to it? You know, some people prefer Ponzi's because it's easier to attract a lot of gullible people and take money and then let it collapse. You know, that doesn't mean, you know, you have to be like that. But if you're inclined in that direction, then that's your choice. But then most people who want to put serious amounts of money in a decent business that is legitimate and has proven its track record, it has very real production facilities that you can even visit with prior appointment, then of course, if you want to deal with serious, honest people, you don't want to be debating with time wasters, frankly. Right, uh, you know, let's face it, buy and hold have limited resources. If they had unlimited resources, they wouldn't care what level they're getting into because if you fundamentally believe in Bitcoin going up in price, it doesn't matter what level you get into because we are still at the baby stages. That was the very first page I showed you with those numbers of what the real potential is going forward for Bitcoin uh, uh, numerically. And 
you know, even if you got in at 3,000 level, well, it's only a temporary loss you face right now when it's hovering around 2,600. But, you know, if it's going to go to 10,000, even entering at 3,000 is a piece of cake, surely. So people of limited means will tend to buy and hold, will exhaust their resources, and then they won't know necessarily what to do next. This is the hypocrisy I wanted to talk about. A buy and hold buyer wants the price to go down so they can buy it on dips. But then they want the price to go up because they also want to profit. That's why they bought some in the first place. Then they want the price to go down again when you know they have enough dollars saved up somewhere else through their jobs or whatever um, in order to buy more. And then they want it to go up again because they want the portion that they recently bought to show a profit as quickly as possible. So they want it to go up and down and up and down and up and down. If you're a miner, you only want it to go up. You don't even want it to go down, do you? If you're a Bitcoin believer, if you're a Bitcoin fanatic, if you're a Bitcoin uh, uh, enthusiast that understands the total potential and what else is going on around the world, in the world of economics, you don't ever want Bitcoin to go down. But who are these up, up and down people? They're the ones who book profit, crush it. Some of them dump it. Some of them you know, push the market as much as they can, and then they pull it down as much as they can. People trying to play around with it and manipulate it. Everything that's wrong in humanity is reflected by that mindset. And there you go, I've told you. <laughs> you know, you can disagree with me. I'm happy with that. No problem. But this is my opinion because if you're a miner, the higher the price, the greater is your mining return. Surely it's a good thing. And for a buy to hold investor, that is also a good thing, except they would have missed out on buying more. But they can only buy more if it actually dips and it gives them some time to save up some dollars. So they're the ones that are not really very confident about Bitcoin constantly going up in price. So that's the difference between a miner and the buy to hold mindset. What happened then? 2015, 2016, 2017, just four aspects. There are hundreds of others. 99bitcoins.com is a fantastic website. Have a look. You'll see the whole history of each of the events. But basically, was China really relaxed and chilled out about Bitcoin in 2015? Eh, not so much. You know, they approved it. They're okay with it. Uh, then they froze a couple of exchanges, and that panicked the Bitcoin people a little bit. Uh, and the Chinese only said, look, we, we want KYC. We want to know who the people are that are buying on these exchanges because, you know, we don't want other outside elements coming in here and messing around uh, with the economy. Uh, and you know this is happening on our territory. We can't we can't allow this. So China wasn't so relaxed in 2015, but 2016 they opened up a little, and now they are even more enthusiastic. They're trying to put uh, greater uh, uh, systems and better systems in place for all the Bitcoin uh, and cryptographic community, generally speaking. In Japan, it wasn't an officially recognized currency. By 2016, it became an officially recognized currency at par with the basket of tradable currencies in Tokyo Exchange. So you, if, you, if you're dealing in Tokyo Forex Exchange, you can treat Bitcoin like any other currency. Now, that has some significant potential. And in 2017, they are further enhancing the acceptance by encouraging major retailers, 230,000-something retailers, to start accepting Bitcoin and displaying on their windows, Bitcoin accepted here. Is that a difference from 2015 to 2017 or not? Australia, even till 2016, they were still mulling, umming, and eyeing about it. But good on them, Aussies, they finally came around in 2017. They have made a proper official tax uh, uh, structure around Bitcoin. They want to know. They, they want the public to know that it's okay to go ahead, but you will be paying your dues over a period of time, and they're not trying to stop it at all. Now, in 2015, 2016, Bitcoin on its own did not have a 60 billion market cap. In 2017, it has reached that. It's a milestone. 60 billion is only the Bitcoin portion. The remaining 40 billion are the remaining cryptocurrencies. If you add the two together, you're looking at 100 billion. This was not the case two years ago. 
So when Bitcoin was languishing in the territory where Bitcoin mining was unprofitable, then at that point, the market cap was measurably reasonably small. Now it's completely different. It's taken everybody by surprise. There's greater acceptance. If this is the case with 2017, then I believe 2018 should look even better, especially anytime there's panic in the regular banking market. Expect more people to open their minds to Bitcoin. Are you ready and are you in position to see that happen? That's your choice. So why do people fear or resist or downplay Bitcoin? It's very, very simple. You know, here in the middle of the, this triangle here, you've got the pioneers. They're at the very top. They're at the pinnacle. They're the ones who were the early, early adopters. They were the ones to devise, even conceptualize things like how the blockchain would work out and pan out, not just the inventor or creator of uh, Bitcoin itself, but he alone wasn't enough. He circulated a white paper. It got some kind of very uh, high levels of interest from others. And they said, look, you should do this. And, you know, in, through correspondence online, through people all across the world, some in California, some in uh, some early adopters were involved in uh, 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 Australia already. And, you know, it took off from there. But they were the pioneers. Then came the mass leaders. These are the people who built a whole uh, a cryptocurrency ecosystem around it. Uh, I would not call Vitaly, uh, Vitalik Buterin the um, uh, uh, creator of Ethereum. I would not call him the pioneer just yet because he literally borrowed the idea, but he's a mass leader because he's basically led a new revolution on the back of what the pioneer started. He learned from Bitcoin and did something slightly better, slightly different. It's not taken off as much yet, but it certainly has a great potential. Although it has its flaws, it has had a number of issues, but it still is a genius idea. And that is just one example. Those are the market, leader, uh, market mass leaders. And then come the newcomers. I would put myself in this category. I'm an awake, relative newcomer to this phenomenon. In 2012, when I was sitting in my office uh, in one of the London banks, um, I hated Bitcoin with a passion. I thought, oh, what a bunch of Muppets. But now it's changed. And the rest of the public that has yet to cross this red line, which is the mass adoption barrier, are generally media influenced. If the media turned around and said, have you considered Bitcoin? There's no harm holding a few, is there? Would you consider doing that? If they did that, why would the, pub the public would react immediately? But because the media doesn't necessarily tell them, the media isn't necessarily pushing it. In fact, the media is always almost trying to paint a negative picture of Bitcoin, the mass influence is yet to catch on. But then this is where we come in. We are awake and we are spreading the awareness. The same applies to any other system. A specialist knows his stuff. He has an apprentice, the learner. And then there are others who are inquiring into the business. And the rest are what you call muggles. They can see everything in plain sight and still they don't know what's going on. Now, it would be unfair to call the masses muggles simply because um, uh, some people are more aware of what is going on financially, economically, in the banking world, um, uh, with the bail-in scenarios and all the legislations in place. It requires education. And unfortunately, education um, uh, is relatively easy to give. It is not easy for people to receive because it requires effort. Now, what would you rather do? Put your feet up, uh, crack open a bottle of bubbly or something, and then watch a nice little program and relax after a long day's work? Or would you get in front of a computer yet again after a day in the office and try and learn yet again something extra in order to improve your life? There are relatively less number of people that are willing to do that. There are a greater number of people that would rather invest their spare time in pleasure. And therefore, uh, you know, I'm not derogatorily calling them muggles, but I'm saying that everything is in plain sight, but they still won't see it because their certain synapses haven't clicked yet. Now, the same thing, I mean, it's exactly the same thing. I'm not going to repeat myself, but I'll just go on to the next one. This is where the misinformation comes from. This is the head of the IMF. 
and at the Davos meeting recently she said Bitcoin is for criminals. Imagine that coming from the super criminals that the IMF themselves are and I'm saying that with a reason because the IMF has been there for donkey's years, the World Bank has been there for donkey's years, they've seen crisis after crisis after crisis, none of the debt laden third world countries as they were called or you know the poorer nations, they're still in debt. Nothing's really improved. So what are you doing exactly? What are these supranational uh, uh, United Nations level uh, tentacles? What have they actually accomplished? Can anyone tell me what have they accomplished that has really changed the lives of people? Other than small little projects here and there which are nice for window dressing, but the warehouse is empty. The world is going bankrupt, uh, you know, almost like going to hell in a handbasket. So this is what it is. Now to end this, I'll tell you the last of my stories, which is about the radio host. Um, thanks to our uh, Bill Wilmot, I was uh, recently invited to uh, uh, one of the uh, radio stations in the United Kingdom. And the radio presenter, lovely lady, um, she had a person who, you know, I was told, and Bill told me that they want to know more for their audience, for their radio audience. They want to know more about uh, what is this Bitcoin thing and what are you doing exactly with gold, silver, Bitcoin? How does that work? They want to explore and educate the public about it, which is great. And, you know, I accepted. So I went down there and we both sat in front of the mic. And uh, this other person who was there who was supposed to know a few things about finance, he started asking questions. And absolutely every stage he was cutting bitcoin to pieces and saying but it could be this but it could be that but it could be the other and i said um you know i asked him later so what are you doing he said oh i'm just playing devil's advocate these are the kind of people that destroyed an entire prosperous empire yeah idiots i'm sorry but idiots complete total utter idiots who told you to play devil's advocate? You invite people onto a radio talk show to educate your audience, and instead of educating them, what you're doing is you're helping plant seeds. Now, thankfully, for every problem and every uh, challenge he threw, I had an answer. In fact, I had a better answer than he could have comprehended. Okay, I was able to tackle him at that point very easily. I would have wiped the floor with him if I only had the chance, if the radio regulator wasn't listening in and they weren't under fear of you know uh, the conversation being uh, uh, appearing to be against the state or something what are we living in is this is not nazi germany is it is this why we supposedly won the war to pretend as if we are living in some kind of, kind of oppressive uh, government anyway i'm just playing the devil's advocate this the motivation behind the person is often the problem when you approach the issue with this is a phenomenon it is taking place it exists there are people involved in it millions and some are waxing lyrical some are a little skeptical no problem it's good to be skeptical ask questions ask demand questions and expect to have answers for those questions be satisfied to a point where you are comfortable with the answers until another doubt comes up and then keep exploring. It's, it's you know, Kaizen, the Japanese Kaizen, it's a process of learning. So keep learning, keep exploring, no problem. But to play devil's advocate for sake of being a smart ass, forgive my language, that is what bankrupts a nation, that kind of an attitude, that kind of a complete uh, uh, busybody pencil pushing type of an attitude um, is what holds back. That is what you call uh, 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 philosophical red tape, you know, just adding layers of thoughts to for no reason, just because you have so much self importance about it. Guys, next time when we have an opportunity on next Wednesday, exactly the same time, I hope you can join us. I want to cover all the other companies. There are companies, I'm going to name them, including their owners, whoever they are, and I'm going to go step by step about what the packages cost what the fees for the packages are, how the income is generated, where the level of transparency is. I'm gonna cover all of them. If you'd like to uh, uh, share this video 
with uh, people who talk about buy and hold type of a discussion and where the skepticism and doubt comes from. I mean, the government of Australia just, you know, literally legalized Bitcoin, the government of Australia. So I'm not really going to listen to my dry cleaner, am I? He, he does laundering of other people's dirty clothes, and he's worried about money laundering through Bitcoin. All the crimes in the world have already been done under the dollar. So I have no reason to spread that kind of negativity, which is baseless and meaningless. Now, this is a shop that doesn't even use Visa cards because they don't want to be connected electronically to anything. So they can remain in the laundry business. But then you have the hairdresser type of person who's like, this is, this is something I can look into. You know, in my own small, little, modest way, I can explore this idea and I will pursue this idea. It may be of interest to me. I'm open to it. Two contrasting people, two stories today, and the radio host show is what represents the mass media. So I hope I've given you an a, a overall picture. Bill, uh, I don't know if there are any questions or anything that's been happening in the chat section. Please let me know. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll end after uh, this review. And then hopefully I can see you. We can both see you uh, next Wednesday when we'll cover all the other companies. All right, guys? So Bill, anything? Yeah, there's no questions. I think um, the main thing coming through is the, is the quality of the presentation. Uh, super impressed by, the, by today's content and delivery. Uh, we know you to be a true professional anyway, but uh, I think it's uh, it's an awesome presentation. Everyone's very happy with what you're saying and looking forward to next week. So guys, if, 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 if it is good, I, I panicked there for a moment and then the quality of presentation, what have I done? Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, well, it's been a while since we've done one of these and um, not everyone's seen you before in, in this sort of mode. So that's probably what we're talking about here. And also a lot has come, a lot of water's flowed under the bridge since we last did one of these, yeah? There's been a lot of change, a lot of excitement. And obviously we've seen the CEO up, up, up front and personal, yeah? Uh, had our first UK conference, and we've got another one coming in September when we can actually pin the dates down and the people want to see there. So, um, yeah, it's all good. I think this year's going to be a huge year for us, huge year. Well, it already is shaping up, and guys, yeah. this is all thanks to the team's effort because, look, I alone can't do anything, okay? So uh, uh, I have a small group of people originally uh, uh, we started with, and then that gradually grew, and now we're gathering momentum, we're trending on social media, which is a great thing. Just don't give up on the momentum, because what's going to happen is you are still getting paid. When other opportunities come and go and come and go and come and go, you are still getting paid and you are constantly there. This is what changes even the skeptics, and they will come. They will come. They're watching you. They're, they're, they're keeping an eye on you. They're watching you earn. And especially if it's positive, they will come. Okay, so keep up the momentum, guys. Don't, don't get disheartened by a few events here and there. But generally speaking, it's going to get better. Now, about the September event, really quickly, um, we can't really put a date down yet. I would really love to. I've already done the inquiries. I found out the venues. There are some lovely venues, and uh, I'm even getting a good package deal for those of you that may be traveling from a little further away. Even if you're flying in from abroad, you know, um, we'll find a good deal with maybe some rooms attached. So if you want to do early book and get yourself a night stay and maybe even tour London while you're there, uh, we'll try and keep it in London. It's going to be a little more pricey than the last one, obviously. Uh, a lot more pricey, to be honest. But, you know, um, we'll, we'll take care of all of that. The reason. I don't have a date yet is because what I would really like in this conference is for you to be able to say there's a top guy from a top company in the Bitcoin mining community who's going to be standing there and delivering a talk for you. If you can say that, I don't want to know, I don't know yet who it could be, but I'm trying to arrange it. So allow me some time. We don't have a date yet. I appreciate some of you will need to take a day off for the conference, but it'll most likely be over a weekend. I am willing to pay for the uh, uh, slightly extra uh, premium over a weekend, but then a weekend is also a time when people uh, are, are generally more free with their time to travel, uh, and you can use either the same day or the latter day uh, on either side of the uh, the event to uh, maybe do some tourist business or some shopping or whatever, you know. So 
uh, we can try and make this in a good event. Again, I want to keep the cost to you as low as possible, but we will have some options for, uh, you know, uh, if you wanted, you know, lunch included or something like that. <coughs> there may be a VIP level with some additional benefits in there or something like that. We haven't figured it out completely yet. But what I'm really waiting for is I want a world-class authority on precious metals not necessarily related to the business. And that's important because here now you have a neutral person that has no financial interest necessarily in delivering the talk to you for any personal gain. They are here to tell you why we are doing the business in the first place. And then if you have a top authority covering the cryptocurrency angle, then if we can have just the names of the speakers, that should be the driving force for you to gather uh, a significant number of uh, people attending. It's going to be a much larger conference. Um, I've already got the pull-up stand, <coughs> and you know, hopefully it'll be good. But guys, if this is if this is uh, you know uh, uh, generally of interest to you, next time I want to break it down for you because I have been involved in a couple of uh, scams before myself, and I got taken for a ride. I got suckered in because you know when I was chatting to the CEO of one of those scams, I asked him, "Where is your gold mining operation?" And he mentioned. Uh, Uzbekistan. I'm like, oh wow, because I know Uzbekistan is a major gold producer, uh, which is formerly uh, Soviet Union, uh, but now an independent nation. So he answered all my questions off the bat. And he was live chatting. And I said, so what's your second operation? He mentioned Al Sukari in Egypt. I'm like, you know Al Sukari? He's like, yeah, 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 we have a small mining stake in there. I'm like, okay, so what's the mining operation like? You're like, we are subcontractors, okay? So what do you do? Blah, blah, blah. He answered absolutely everything. So I thought it was a real business. It was a Ponzi. Now, I am so wary of this because there are a few people that really got hurt, a few people that really got burnt uh, because of my involvement in it, and I led them into something that was doomed, yeah? And frankly speaking, every time I think about it, I am personally heartbroken that I led other people. You know, it's building up other people's hopes and then letting them down. It's not so easy to say, oh, we all take risk. You know, online business is always risky. This is what scammers say, yeah? No, a proper registered, properly constituted company is not the kind of risk. The risk is the job, and the risk is following a leader who will sell you just about anything for sake of commissions. And that is where I want to be personally very, very careful. So this is why, you know, the idea is we lead, we try and lead with value. This video is for you to show to anybody that starts arguing about buy and hold, um, you know, starts arguing about Bitcoin being a bubble, starts arguing about, you know, skepticism around bubble. Yeah, I'm not sure. Show them this. And we will have a lot more of these. I want to do these more regularly. You know, if you guys are really up for it, then let's do it properly. All right. But thank you very much, guys, for being here, for staying so long. It's, it's just over an hour. And I want to thank Bill Wilmot for engaging you all. And uh, thank you very much. And good night.